Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us once again this morning on Facebook Live. I'm Amber, the Public Science Events Manager at the Bell Museum, and today we're continuing our preparations for, Hall for Halloween by getting ready with some spooky science. Today I'm actually joined by Adam, our Gallery Programs Assistant, and who is at the museum inside the Touch and See Lab, and he's going to share with us one of our special animals, an animal that's prepared and always ready for Halloween because it always has a costume on. Uh, Adam, thank you for joining us. Can you tell us a little bit about the milk snake? Hi guys. Yeah, so this is our milk snake. And like Amber said, she's always prepared for Halloween because she's always got a costume on. And the reason she's always got a costume on is because it, uh, it's very, it's good for her, it protects her. So um, the costume she's wearing actually is that of a coral snake. And she didn't do a very good job because the coloration is a little off. The coral snake, this is a fake one right here that I've got. Um, We've got red, yellow, or sorry, black, yellow, red, yellow is, is the coral snake coloration. And the milk snake coloration right here is black, red, black, white, or yellow. And so the reason that it looks like that is the milk snake is actually mimicking the coloration of the coral snake. And the reason it does that is because the coral snake is highly venomous. And the milk snake takes advantage of that by mimicking its colors in what we call Batesian mimicry. And what Batesian mimicry is, is it's when one species, which is harmless, the milk snake, uh, mimics the coloration or the patterning of a venomous or dangerous species like the coral snake. And that way predators or other animals that might cause, uh, cause it harm or wanna eat it, might see it and think that it's something that is more dangerous than it actually is. So this milk snake right here is not venomous, um, but it sure looks like it. And so the, the easy way to tell if you ever come across a snake that looks kind of like this in the wild is red on yellow, kill a fellow, red on black, friend to jack, or in this case, it's kind of white. So maybe black on white, non-venomous bite. If you want to think about it that way. Just getting kind of, <laughs> kind of fast there. The milk snake knows that uh, knows that you're talking about it. <laughs> I know it's it's coming at my face right now. Yeah. Okay. Let's get her. I'll, let you, right I'll let you reposition the snake. Can you tell us a little bit maybe about why it's called a milk snake? Yeah. So the reason it's called a milk snake. Oh wow. Okay. <laughs> the reason it's called a milk snake is because uh, there. You know, a long time ago, farmers used to find. Um, milk snakes in their barns, and they thought that milk snakes were uh, drinking their nursing cow's milk. And obviously that's not true for a couple reasons. Uh, first of all, snakes don't eat milk. They, they probably couldn't even digest it. They're carnivores. Um, and then they, they also don't have lips. So, you know, they would, they would probably just bite onto the cow and, and nothing would happen. So um, that's not true, but that is where they get their name, the milk snake. On here. <laughs> um, right. Milk snakes are a uh, species of king snake, and king snakes are uh, infamous for their. They, they like to eat other snakes, and so if if we were to put her in a in a tank with another snake and she was hungry, it's possible that she could eat another snake, including uh, venomous species. If you at any point in time need to need to take the snake back to the cage, I think we would we would understand that. Um, I do also want to just let our audience know that's watching on Facebook. If you have any questions for Adam about the milk snake or about um, some of the other animals that are in the Touch and See Lab, we'd be happy to answer those live right now. Um, I'm kind of keeping an eye on our comment box. Um, are are milk snakes native to Minnesota? So in Minnesota, we do have a species of milk snake. It is not this species. Um, this is called a Pueblin milk snake and they're native to central Mexico, kind of in more arid regions. Um, in Minnesota, Southern Minnesota specifically, we do have Eastern milk snakes. Um, they don't look like this. They've got kind of a um, kind of tan, white, pink, red coloration. They're not striped either. They have um, kind of a different patterning on their back. Um, but this, they are, they are the same, um, species, just different subspecies of uh, milk snake. So you'll see that she keeps flicking her tongue out like that. And the reason she does that 
is um, to collect scent particles in the air. And so what she's doing is she'll flick her tongue out, she'll collect uh, microscopic scent particles, and then she'll be able to tell what's around her um, by bringing those scent particles to an organ in the back of the mouth called the Jacobson's organ or the uh, vomeronasal organ. And the reason that her tongue is forked too is so that she can tell which direction the scents are coming from. So if she gets more particles, um, <laughs> more scent particles from prey on her right side, um, she'll know that she needs to go right to go find prey because their eyesight isn't very good. You know, as we get ready for Halloween, I think snakes are one of those things that that some people in particular find spooky and, and might have a little bit of a fear of. Mm -hmm. um, are there are there any myths about snakes that you can help us bust today in terms of um, are they dangerous? Are they slimy? All of those things that might make people a little a little fearful of snakes. So that is a good question. I, no myths specifically, but you mentioned sliminess. Um, snakes are not slimy. They're very, um, very smooth um, because they don't have any legs to get them around, which is probably uh, another reason that people are so afraid of them. Um, they have to scoot along the ground. And so uh, it's, it's hard to do that if you're really rough. So they have a lot of really smooth scales so they can just slither along the ground. In fact, um, I don't know if you can see here, but the, the bottom of, uh, of snakes, um, they have a single scale called a scoot, and they use their row of scoots to do exactly that. They scoot along the ground, so they, they kind of grip it and pull themselves forward instead of uh, walking with legs. And they're not, they're not dangerous either. Um, it's good to be cautious around snakes in case you don't know if they're venomous or not, but they are, uh, they're more afraid of you than you are of them, which is you know what we say for, for most animals. So. They just want to have a good time and live like the rest of us. So we did have one question that came in, and I know you answered this a little bit a uh, little bit earlier, but about how the milk snake got its name. Mm -hmm. Do you have, do you have anything more on that story, or maybe where that comes from? Uh, just just a myth or a folk tale that, um, that you know a lot of these these kinds of snakes are found in barns, um, dairy barns. And so uh, people used to think that they were drinking cow's milk, but they can't do that and they, they don't do that. So that they, but they kept their name, obviously. They're still called milk snakes. You'll be happy to know that Danielle thinks that the milk snake is so cute. <laughs> she <laughs> is. Have some fans. I wonder if you get <laughs> how close we can get her to your, yeah. she's very nice. And she's so, pretty freshly shed, so she's nice and shiny. She decided to clean up for you guys. So, so snakes are obviously, as reptiles, they're cold-blooded. Are there any changes, um, especially, I mean, obviously you're indoors, but especially as we get into the winter months, are there any changes to how snakes in the wild would actually live? Uh, so snakes that live in um, areas like Minnesota that have great seasonal change do uh they'll hibernate um or yeah so so they'll they'll bury themselves underground or you know in in some kind of hole somewhere and they'll hunker down for the winter and, and come back in the spring but um since she is a species that is typically native to central mexico where they don't have those those big seasonal changes um i have i've never noticed any change in her behavior um during the the colder months here so She's just as active as ever. She's on my back now. Now, I know when we were talking about this earlier, um, we, keep, we keep calling her a she, but we don't actually know whether this milk snake is a boy or a girl, correct? Uh, I, I don't know. I'm, I, I'm pretty sure I've been told it's a she, but there are only a couple ways to tell um, whether snakes are male or female. One way to do that is to probe their cloaca and you can tell if they're male or female depending on the depth that your probe goes. Um, but that's a really invasive procedure. And, you know, we don't need to know if she's male or female for, for our sake. So uh, I, I don't know. Uh, the, the other way that you might be able to tell is if she lays an egg, obviously she's a female, whether it's a fertile egg or not. So, and I've, I've never seen her lay an egg. So she could be either. 
Well, thank you so much, Adam, for sharing the milk snake with us and, and telling us a little bit about it, about its special costume. Um, I want to I wanna encourage everyone to check out the Bell Museum's website. We have some special programming that'll be going on leading up into these days leading up to Halloween. Um, and in the Touch and See Lab in particular, each day that we're open, we'll be doing some owl pellet dissections every day at 11 o'clock. And then we'll also be doing some, um, some observations of flesh-eating beetles at one o'clock each day. Um, so there's lots of things to see and do and check out on our website as we lead up to Halloween. I want to I wanna thank Adam and the Milk Snake once again for joining us today. I hope you all have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you for having us.